Okay, so now we have the fun of working on the actual joinery side of these side rails. Now you might be wondering why we're starting our joinery on the side rails when we don't even have the headboard or the footboard started. And the trick here is, is that this is a very easy place to start because these are kind of the immovable object of this entire bed. Because I don't want to have to take any more thickness off of these or you know, do anything to these to change them just physically speaking. So once we get these together, once we cut our joinery on here, then we know that these pieces are what we're fitting everything else to. So this is one of the rails from the headboard. So realistically speaking, if I have to replace this board, that, that sucks, but it's not as bad as potentially having to replace this board if I screw up on the joinery. And so what we have to figure out now is how we're going to get these boards squared up and cut to an accurate length. Because we have two issues here. Normally what I'd do to square up a board is I would put on the table saw, use my miter gauge, push the board across the table saw, and it leaves me a nice perfectly square edge that I then know is perpendicular to either sides of my edges here. But the trick is, obviously, I can't put this board on my table saw because not only is it about four times larger than the length of my table saw, it just it's too heavy to push with a miter gauge. So another option would be a miter saw or a radial arm saw. I do own a miter saw and I don't trust it to get me anywhere near the accuracy that I need here. So we're kind of left with figuring out some other random options. So what we're gonna do is I have a few different ideas of stuff that I think is gonna work, but the first one we're gonna try is just making a little MDF jig. So we're gonna take a couple of pieces of MDF and we're gonna use it to make a sawing jig. So I've got this one here. I don't know if any of the edges on it are square or straight. So we're gonna start by passing it over the jointer, which is the nice thing about MDF is you can actually joint it. Unlike plywood, if you put plywood over your jointer, it's going to destroy the blades. So that's why I'll mainly buy MDF to just keep around the shop here, uh, because you can work it like normal wood. It's, it's not gonna damage your machinery as bad. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna start by jointing this one edge here so that I know that all the way across here, it is perfectly straight, because that's all that matters. Nothing here has to be square. I just need this edge to be straight all the way across. Then we're gonna take this other piece, do the same thing of just jointing this edge to make sure that it's perfectly straight. Then we're going to attach the two pieces of wood together and make sure that they are perfectly 90 degrees from this edge to this edge. Then once we flip it over, we now have a perfect saw guide to cut that nice straight line there. attempt with this MDF jig some interesting things are happening. So on this side that we're starting from here if we put the square up against it uh, we can quite easily see that it is not at all square it's tapering quite heavily and, but if we put the square on the other side and compare it we can see that it's right near the edge here it is perfectly square. So what this is telling me and you can kind of see it in the wood here on this side the wood is a little bit darker where it's cut and up here it's lighter where it's cut. So what this is telling me is that as the saw is cutting, it's cutting perfectly square and true, but only where the blade is. Obviously this blade is not perfectly aligned to the saw, so as it cuts, the back side of the blade is dragging along and changing that cut. So the front of the blade is cutting perfectly true just where we want it to because that's where we lined up here but the back side of that blade is not cutting true at all. So what I'm gonna try and do is I have a DeWalt circular saw, a corded one, and I'm gonna try using that and see if it performed any differently. performed astronomically worse than the rigid. Uh, this doesn't go, I don't think this really says anything about either the brands. Uh, they are very different saws. The rigid one was about a $200 saw, whereas the dual one was about, you know, I think it was like a $150 saw. Plus when you get a corded saw, they're jack. I don't even know. Maybe this, does, maybe this says everything about the brands. But between those two circular saws that I own, 
neither of them are going to work for what I need here. So the next option is I think using our same strategy here, what we can do is when we cut the board to length, we can get, get it to a fairly rough size with the circular saw because we know we're going to have that slight issue there where we're not going to get a perfectly straight across cut. Then we can go back into the router using our new little straight edge here, follow this straight edge with the router with a half inch spiral bit in it, and that should clean up this surface. And because that spiral bit has a much smaller surface area, it should give us a perfectly straight edge and a perfectly vertical edge in here. So this is really one of those things right now where I'm just kind of experimenting to see what I can do. Because again, I would love to work with large boards like this in the future, uh, but it is really a challenge if you can't cut a board like this square. If I had a good miter saw or a good radial arm saw, this wouldn't really be an issue. Now probably the best way to make sure I could get this square would be using like a shooting board, but I have no idea how to support this whole massive thing on a shooting board and get any kind of accuracy with it. So, so if any of you are hand tool users and you've you know worked with a massive chunk of wood like this before and you've used a shooting board to get that end square, I would love to hear how you do it because I, I have a shooting board, uh, but yeah, I don't know how to balance you know, I don't know. I don't know how to balance this board accurately across, you know, across its whole length here. Uh, I'd keep it both vertically aligned and, you know, and keep it uh, perpendicular to these outside edges. Okay, router. Horrible idea. Uh, this uh, I tried to lock this in. I didn't lock it in obviously good enough. Even in the beginning part here, where this was still fairly locked in place, because you have the clamp right there, I it's, I can very well even just feel that it's not a flat surface. So that option is not going to work. Kind of, uh, I'm kind of stumped on this one. So I have to make this cut with one of the circular saws. Then I have to be able to clean it up enough to make sure that I can still uh, use it. What I could do is I could take my shooting board because all it is is it's two pieces of MDF just laminated on top of each other. So if I take two pieces of MDF that are the same thickness, put them at the far end of the board, put my shooting board at this end of the board, then I can make the cut with the circular saw that'll get me mostly square. Then I should be able to align my shooting board to this edge back here, clean up that surface there, and that should give me enough accuracy here. So I am at this point kind of stumped. So I set up the shooting board here, got my loyal jack out, tried to do it, uh, and it is not really working either. Uh, one of the big things is obviously it's not really cutting nicely, but I know I need to sharpen this 25 degree blade if I was actually going to do it. So no matter what I do with the shooting board, I can't seem to get it to cooperate with me. So either the shooting board itself is shifting and moving around, or this board is shifting and moving around. I don't really have a way to clamp this stuff down and hold it in place. And so the options that I'm looking at now are stuff that I can pay for in order to solve my issue here. Because obviously with the stuff that I have in the shop, I don't think it's going to work out. So one of the best options I can see would be a track saw. So I'm looking at the Festool one uh, because that seems, that's well, I mean, that's one of the only ones you can actually buy. All the other brands, you know, Bosch, DeWald, all these other ones, you have to special order them and it could be up to a week. Uh, so the Festool one, I know I could go and pick up today and that would probably solve the problem pretty quick. The problem is, well, the only problem with that is that's, that's a big investment. Now it's a tool that I've wanted for a long time for doing, for you know, for exact occasions like this. The other option would be something like a good miter saw setup. So going with one of your better name brand miter saws. So either like a Bosch, a DeWalt, Makita, uh, Milwaukee, whatever. Because the one that I have right now is a Mastercraft. Since most of my viewership is in the US, you probably don't never even heard of that brand, but it's a Canadian tire brand up here in Canada. As far as I consider it, it's, you know, it's even below Ryobi in quality. So it's not a, so it has absolutely no accuracy to it, which kind of sucks. Okay, so decision is made. I'm not gonna spend money. Uh, it's very enticing to, uh, I found a few different places here in Calgary where I could just go and pick up the uh, Fest Tool track saw with a 55 inch track, all that stuff. Uh, for 900 or for around 900 bucks oh really enticing you know it's one of those tools that i've wanted for a long time this would be the justification to buy that but i'm going to do the responsible thing and not buy it we're not really going to be ever referencing the end of this board here once we actually start cutting our tenon because what we'll do when we need to cut our tenons is we'll lay our square on the edge of this board and then mark our line across here. So we're gonna be making that line perfectly perpendicular to our edges anyway. And we're gonna be doing that with the router, which I know will work a little bit better. Also then we can very easily tune up that shoulder, uh, either with my block plane, or again, if I wanna consider bringing a new tool into the shop, I could look at getting like a Veritas shoulder plane, something like that. I've thought about, I've I've actually been planning, you know, I've been watching Lee Valley the last time I checked, they were out of stock sadly, uh, but I'll check again. And if they are back in stock, this 
this might be the one of the perfect projects to introduce a shoulder plane because I do a lot of mortise and tenon joinery and not having a shoulder plane is a very annoying thing. So I think if I'm gonna if I was gonna introduce one tool into the shop during this project, a shoulder plane is much more beneficial than you know a track saw because a track saw will give me a perfect cut here and it might give me a perfect shoulder here, but it doesn't allow me to adjust those things. So the whole thing with the MDF jig, measuring, marking, all that stuff did not work out. We are now an eighth of an inch difference between these two boards, so that is a problem and we're gonna have to deal with it. So just giving it a quick measure, it comes out to about 83 and 7 eighths, whereas our other one is pretty much precisely on 84. I'm not sure where the inconsistency came from. I set up the cut the same way both times. Uh, so it's just it's just one of those things. So, so I have to say that if you're someone who's in a more permanent setup shop, uh, you have the ability to you know set up an actual like miter station that would be the ideal way to deal with these kind of boards. Um, just because dealing with doing some, doing it this way, super inaccurate, uh, there's no repeatability, there's no way to make sure that your stuff is coming out the same size. And so just kind of quickly checking out the boards here before I start jumping and doing stuff, I wanna figure out what's causing my issues here. Uh, and so it looks like uh, when I set my thing up to be, uh, it wasn't registering a square, so I figured that you know maybe I bumped something on the jig, maybe I just was in a little bump on the side here. So this top corner we're at 84, at the bottom corner we're at 83 and 7 eighths, so we're, eight, we're about an eighth of an inch out. So what I'm noticing now that I'm actually checking this, I don't think I actually checked this after I cut it uh, with the, when we did the lengthwise cuts with the circular saw, is that we are uh, not good. That's uh, even over the 36 inch span of this little bit of a shorter straight edge, I can see that I've got big areas where we're just clearly not straight at all. So. Uh, and that's on both sides. So whether it was the uh, Craig jig that kind of screwed up or it was using the uh, MDF straight edge, uh, neither of them really did a good job. And yeah, I can see definitely here, we have a massive gap. So there's definitely a lot of issues with uh, how we set things up here. So for this, I really wish that I had uh, thought of the whole track saw thing sooner because that probably would have uh, helped with this whole end thing here. Uh, but the only downside to that is that's, again, you're really talking a lot of money because buying a track that would be long enough to actually do this whole thing would be quite expensive. All right guys, so I apologize how for how bad this video is going. Uh, there's just some days in the shop where, you know, you get stumped on doing a certain task and you can't really figure out how to get around it. So this is just some of the days, you know, this is one of those days that probably wouldn't end up in the videos uh, if I was just putting out a video series on the bedroom set because I just, I'm just, I'm just completely stumped right now. So obviously when we cut these straight edges, they are nowhere near uh, good enough. <laughs> they are nowhere near accurate. So when I was trying to measure uh, right angles and all that on the end grain, way off there, you know, no, there's really no point to that. So the saws might actually be just fine and perfect, uh, but I can't ever know uh, because I put this cherry blank that we jointed one edge on and we have probably, I don't know, almost a quarter of an inch gap at this end. Uh, and then it's sitting flat the most of the way, but this end of this specific board, I haven't checked the other one yet, uh, but this end, we have, it definitely t it definitely dishes in and tapers at this end. And so I really should have checked this before I cut them to length and did anything like that. We still have plenty of material, we're still, we're still fine. Uh, but yeah, this is definitely something that I should have checked because on this end, we're about 11 and uh, 15 sixteenths. And then on the other end, we're 12 and a sixteenth. So we do have an eighth of an inch difference between the width on that end and the width on this end, which is, which is manageable. Again, a lot of this stuff, you know, back in the day before they had all the fancy tools that we have, uh, they managed to build all this kind of stuff. So what you can do with this is go through and do a lot of hand tool stuff and you know, yada, yada, yada. Now, my only problem is, is I'm not very proficient with my hand tool usage. And so I don't know if I wanna go all the way through this whole process 
relying on, okay, well, I can save it with my hand tool. I, you know, the hand tools are how I'm gonna save this. And so just kind of sitting here thinking about it, uh, I could go through with the hand plane and try and square up the edge. The only downside of the hand plane is getting your wits uh, dialed in is a little bit, again, I'm not super proficient with my uh, hand tool usage. So getting that width dialed in there would be challenging, but that might be, that might be the best option because then I can actually go in, remove material, I can remove some of these humps that are obviously in here, all that kind of stuff. So I just redid this edge on this board. We are now nice and straight all the way across. I checked it with the winding sticks to make sure that we didn't introduce any twist to it. And overall, we're looking really good. And so the last thing we need to check here is for square against the faces. Now this is where we do have a minor issue. So our high side is this front face here and we're sloped downwards like that. And we can double check it by confirming against both faces because just because of the way that we milled these boards, there may be some inconsistencies to it. And so if you have that in one area over the length, all that means is that you just hit one area of the board a little bit more than the other. You know, you hit one side more than the other with your hand plane. But what this is telling me as I go down the board and check here is that my, my plane blade, although I thought when I set it up on that little maple block, I thought I set it up nice and square, it's clearly not nice and square. It has a little bit of a slope to it. And the only reason I can tell that right now is because I have that consistent error all the way down. And so to fix the issue here of our, our blade being a little bit skewed, all we're gonna do is just take a little tapping device. So I've got this old chisel with a plastic handle and I just tapped on the side of the little brass knob in the back here. And all that does is just slightly skew the blade one way or the other. And then the trick here is you just wanna keep checking it and checking it and checking it until you dial it in. Again, it's gonna take a little bit. Uh, you're probably gonna have to do a couple passes depending on how much of a slant you, you introduced in there with your first few sets of passes, you know, you're gonna have to counteract that. It's gonna take a little bit of extra work and you wanna make sure that you're only going as far as you think you need. So do make very minor adjustments, see if you can get that slant out. And if you can't get that slant to come out, then you know that your blade is still slightly tilted. Then you adjust it a little bit more, make more passes until you try to get that slant out. If that slant's still there, keep adjusting the plane. So it's very, you're making very minor adjustments because once we get the plane set up for this edge, we can do all, we can do the other three edges that we need to do, all with knowing the plane is gonna be perfectly set up.
So now on both sides of the board, I have a pencil line that I know is perfectly parallel to this edge. So now I know that if I hand plane down to that pencil line, I'm going to have this edge on this opposite side perfectly parallel to this edge on this side. So in order to do that, again, just another little shop jig of uh, some MDF uh, stuck together with some pin nails. Just made sure that this was nicely squared up, measured up exactly 11 and 7 eighths, and I just used this to guide my line all the way across. So now when I do the other board, I now have the exact measurement that I used on this board already set up. I just take it, ride it along, do the exact same thing I did here, and it makes everything work a little bit better. And so it's as easy as that. We now have two nearly parallel edges. Again, I'm not ever gonna get the kind of precision that I would get from cutting a board on like the table saw, but this is about as good as I can get with the hand plane. It's about as much as my skill level can do. So running this uh, little jig along here, I can feel that there are some areas where I went a little bit low. Uh, there's also some areas where I'm still a little bit high, uh, but I, for the most part, it's nothing, you know, it's, it's like you can just barely feel the edge there. So it's nothing that I'm going to worry about because at this stage I'm happy with where it's at. I don't, I don't want to keep messing with it because the more I mess with it, the more chance there is I'm going to screw it up. Especially on the areas where I am a little bit higher, I don't want to take them down because I might take them down a little bit too much. You know, all that kind of stuff. Alright guys, so I apologize, I was really hoping to get to uh, cutting the tenons and the joinery onto these side rails today, uh, but there's just, I just don't have enough time. Uh, doing the whole resizing and that took a long time, you know, manually doing everything with the hand plane. Although it works out really well, it's a very time consuming process. So, basically everything I've learned so far in this project is when you're dealing with big, big boards like this, there's a lot, of, you know, things are going to take a lot more time when you're in a small shop like this. The last thing I want to do today before I close down the shop is do a little bit more epoxy work. So we do have, so as you guys already seen, we have a big knot on this one board. Uh, so on the back side, I threw on some tuck tape just to make sure that we, in case it goes through, uh, I don't think it'll actually be able to punch all the way through, but in just in case it does, it's not going to leak everywhere. We're also going to touch up this uh, back stretcher for, that's going to be on the headboard, uh, that big knot that we've been trying to fill constantly. Uh, because I've resealed it off with some new tuck tape, so hopefully we should be pretty good. So the big difference between epoxies is this is some one-to-one uh, -one ratio epoxy and sets up in about 24 hours, I believe. Yeah, so it sets up in 24 to 48 hours, whereas that other epoxy I used, the deep pour epoxy, is meant to set up in 48 hours. So it's that's why, you know, even when we were looking at it, it was still pretty tacky a couple days after pouring it. So now that we have a good base of that deep pour epoxy in this uh, board here, we can throw in some of this one-to-one -one ratio stuff just to top it off, just to, you know, fill up that hole finally. While we're doing this uh, knot that we got on the this uh, big stretcher here, and we can just make the best use of our epoxy time. Oh yeah, and if you guys are wondering about brand, I don't, this Unoki or something. It's just, a, if you go on Amazon, there's a lot of really random generic brands of epoxy resin that you can buy. If you're not doing something like an epoxy river table, you don't need, you know, fancy epoxy. You know, the stuff that I used here, the deep pour stuff is a Black Forest brand epoxy. Yeah, there was really no reason to use it other than I had it for when I tried to do a little bit of a, a, a live edge river thing. The nice thing about it is it has a little bit more working time than like your five minute epoxies, which is what I would normally use to fill cracks and knots and that. Uh, so this is gonna work a lot better here. Uh, for the knots that are on this bigger stretcher, we could use five minute epoxy, but this stuff is gonna soak in a little bit more and just help stabilize this because we do have some cracks forming around these knots.
So I'm just gonna stand here for a little while and add some epoxy as it soaks into both all of these knot holes here. Uh, just because as it, you know, it'll slowly work its way in, I can just pour in a little bit more. So in the next video we're working on the bed here, we're gonna be starting to do the tenon work on these uh, side rails. So I think it's gonna be very similar to cutting like a breadboard end, but it's also gonna be completely different because this is a very thick piece of wood and I've never cut tenons into, you know, this thickness of wood before. So it's gonna be kind of fun to just see what happens. So as always guys, I do hope you enjoyed this video and I will see you in the next one. Thank you.